and I'm surrounded by people. Okay. So, nice. <laughs> and, and the Fidalgo pool. I get to yeah, go right. to the Fidalgo pool, those who are <laughs> raising money for it, who keep us healthy and keep us well. Yeah, it's a good, it's a good resource. <laughs> Okay, it's 7.01, so I'm gonna start the meeting. And um, Willie, if you could just click people in when they show up. Um, this is uh, welcome and good evening. And I wanna thank everybody for joining the Fidelgo Democrats Zoom meeting. Uh, my name's Barbara Cooper, and I am the chair of uh, the Fidelgo Democrats. And I like to tell folks what we are. The Fidelgo Democrats are an independent democratic association with a focus on education. Um, I like to remind everyone that we're not a PAC. Um, we cannot endorse candidates or contribute to their campaigns. We can't use our mailing list. Um, that's how we uh, set ourselves up when we initially set up a few years ago. And the reason we did that was because PACs are expensive and we uh, felt Skagit Democrats uh, does a really good job with that. So I like to remind folks about that. Um, Sarah, um, we'll start our meeting with an acknowledgement and Sarah uh, Peterson will do that. Thank you, Barbara. Um, we the Fidalgo Democrats acknowledge that we gather on indigenous land. The traditional territories <clears throat> of the Coast Salish, particularly the Samish and the Swinomish. Um, we pay our respects to their elders of the past, present, and future. Thank you. Okay, I'm gonna move along. Our next meeting is gonna be Tuesday evening, um, August 9th. And we're gonna have a speaker from Common Cause to discuss the issues of a possible con uh, constitutional convention, Article 5. Um, and what it would mean uh, to our country and democracy. And we'll send out a flyer uh, closer with a little more information. Um, it's an interesting topic that Common Cause is really in involved with. So uh, just to let you know. And the next, uh, Bob Dahl would like to talk about the gala real quickly. Bob, are you still hanging in there? Okay, where's Bob? There you are, Bob. You're muted. Bob, you're muted. How's that? Hey, there yeah. you go. Great. Thank you. <clears throat> Let me try again. Uh, <laughs> I'm Bob Dahl, and uh, Thank you, Barbara, and thank you, everybody who's online tonight. I only want to take a few minutes uh, to say that I hope you know that Skagit Democrats has scheduled their annual fundraiser for October 8th, Saturday, October 8th, at the uh, Swinomish Casino. Um, as in the past, we will have start out with a uh, meet and greet for all Democratic candidates, and you'll have a chance to meet all of them at that time. But the gala is somewhat labor intensive. And so I'm appearing tonight to ask each of you in the audience to think about offering your services to the gala as a volunteer. No experience is necessary, uh, but wearing a mask may be required. Uh, hours are very flexible. But we do need more hands. So if there is anyone out there tonight who can volunteer any of their time for the preparation of the gala, please call me, Bob Dahl, at 360-202-6212. That's 360-202-6212. Thank you, Barbara, and thank you, everybody online tonight. Okay, thanks, Bob, for all your work on that. If you'd like to, you can put your number in the chat. Um, but Oh, that's a good idea. Thank you. I will. Okay, great. Um, I'm, I'm gonna, um, before I introduce the speaker tonight, um, I was going to uh, see if there's any PCOs or any uh, Democratic Party officials here at the moment. 
Uh, Bar Barbara, I was going to propose if you wish to introduce uh, Melissa, Melissa Beaton. Right. She is, uh, I'm sorry. I, no. okay. okay. There's a couple of people that I've seen. Um, Melissa, would you like to introduce yourself real quickly and let us know what you're running for? Sure. First off, <clears throat> I'd like to say thank you for the invite. Um, my colleague, Jack Jackie Brunson, has attended a couple of your meetings, and I keep saying, how come I'm not invited? So, <laughs> so I want to say thank you very much for including me. Um, I am the current Skagit County Clerk, and I am seeking re-election, and I say a prayer every night because I am running unopposed, which means that I can uh, really continue my focus on the clerk's office. So, um, just to show a hands, who knows what the clerk's office does? <laughs> All right, a couple of you, good. <laughs> if you don't, that's okay. That means we're staying out of the news. And that also means that um, you haven't either come in for a passport or had a reason um, you know, to be connected to a superior court case. So we are, uh, county clerks are independently elected and um, to represent the public. And so we're the official record keeper of the Superior Court for uh, the case management and also the administrative arm. So that's what we do. Um, I, I just figured, I mean, I've been in this, well, not in the clerk, but I have been in the legal field since I was 17 years old. I started out as an errand person for Bannister, Bruin and Clark a very long time ago. And I love what I do. And um, I just thought if you guys have any questions for me, great. Otherwise, I look forward to uh, listening to Deborah speak. Okay, thank you so much, Rosa. And thank you for coming. You bet. And that was, that's really wonderful. Um, and I see Danny is here and you are running as well. And you are not running unopposed. So <laughs> If you'd like to just introduce yourself and let folks know what you're running for. Yes, uh, again, like Melissa said, thank you for inviting me, Barbara, and thank you everyone for, for having me. Um, my name is Danny Hagen. I'm running for Skagit County Assessor. Uh, I'm raised in Skagit County. I have four biological brothers, 10 foster brothers. Uh, I have four young kids of my own, seven, five, two, and one, so I'm quite busy. Um, and I wanted to say why you should vote for me for three main reasons. I, I'm, I've been in the office for almost eight years now, and I've excelled at almost everything I've done in that office, from customer service to GIS to database administration. Um, I've, I've done all that really well. I'm a published author, uh, keynote speaker at, at national conferences. Second, I have the leadership abilities necessary to, to lead that office. Um, I'm a Leadership Skagit class of 2018 graduate. Uh, I was an advisor for the classes of 2019 and 2020 and a master advisor for the classes of 2021 and 2022. Um, still, still involved. Um, and lastly, I have a really deep passion for Skagit County. Um, I do a lot of volunteering. I'm treasurer of the LaConnor Youth Soccer Association, vice chair of the Chinook Board of, or Chinook Enterprises um, Board of Directors, uh, and also, past president of the Shine and Rise Cedar Willie Toastmasters. Um, if any of you have any questions about, uh, about what the assessor's office does or why I have um, all the qualities necessary, um, I will leave my website in the chat and you guys can visit it, but I really appreciate this time. And I also am looking forward to listening to Deborah talk. Okay, yeah. Melissa, if you'd like to put your info in the, in the chat or and Danny or anyone else who has information that they'd like to share, uh, please feel free to put it in the chat and everyone can see it. Um, I don't see anyone else. If I've missed someone, please let me know. Um, uh, Bar Barbara, if I, if I may, please forgive me for the. I believe uh, Andrew Lipton is representing Mr. Shaver, uh, uh, Clyde oh, Shaver. Great. Okay, Andrew, if you could uh, let us a few words um, on uh, Clyde, that would be great. Yeah, yeah. Thank you so much for uh, having me and allowing me to speak. Uh, you know, unfortunately, Clyde uh, couldn't couldn't make it tonight, so I'm here on his behalf, um, and it's a pleasure to be here. Uh, the campaign so far is going well. Uh, right now, the uh, the one metric we have to to really measure how we stand against our opponent is fundraising. We've actually outraised Greg Gilday uh, so far, but the uh, HR. Uh, 
DC. Uh, they just uh, they just put fourteen grand into uh, Greg and, and Karen's coffers. So we know that there's going to be a lot of money flowing in, especially in a year that uh, Republicans think they're going to play offense. They don't want to lose this seat. So they're going to they, they see a candidate like Clyde and they, they know that they're going to they, they've got their hands full. Um, so we're going to really need uh, as, as much volunteer, as much manpower as we can get to, uh, you know, get out on the doors and talk to voters and about why Clyde's such a great candidate. And, uh, you know, with uh, everything, um, everything going on in the world that uh, we, we uh, you know, we not only want to protect the Washington, uh, the Democratic majority in Washington State House, we want to increase that. Um, so yeah, we actually had the chance to have uh, Greg on the record yesterday at the League of Women Voters uh, uh, a forum, and he he hit, when asked about Roe versus Wade, he said it was a non-issue in Washington, and that people he's hearing people are more concerned with public safety and inflation. Well, we know it's not a non-issue in Washington because we've heard him say it before at, at a federal level, and they're they're going to try and pull the same stuff they did there at the state level so like i said uh you we're going to need everyone to get involved and uh we appreciate your support and thank you okay great if you want to put uh the information on how to contact the uh in the chat that would be great yep all right thank you so much for coming um i is there anyone else that's running for public office that i missed i do apologize if i've missed you uh, but barbara if i may i think David Brunson just joined us. Uh, I think his wife, his wife told him to join us, I think. Yeah. Uh, hi, David. Uh, Jackie, um, I think, is busy t this evening, if I'm not mistaken. Right. So, you know what? Hey, thank you so much uh, for giving us a couple quick minutes. But uh, we are, we're in Ellensburg. Jackie's the legislative chair for all county treasurers in the state of Washington. And we are at the Wasai Conference right now, and she's working on some things. But uh, she want to know, we really appreciate all of your support for Dago Dems have. She's running unopposed and wants to give her time to the candidates who have opponents. But she didn't want to snub you guys and, and let you know that, hey, we're, we're not showing up. We are showing up. She's just in meetings right now, and, and she would love to be here. So unfortunately, you get me. But uh, uh, just know that we so much appreciate all the support we've always gotten from Fidalgo Democrats. And we wish uh, all, the, all the candidates running with opponents uh, the best election season that they can have. Great. Thank you so much. Yeah, uh, Jackie had uh, just uh, emailed me saying she was busy tonight. So thank you for coming. Appreciate that. And appreciate no problem. Support. We we just didn't want you guys to think we, it wasn't important. It is important to us. And but she's you know she's committed right now to to doing stuff legislatively and and working hard for all everybody in Skagit County. So but thank you so much for including us. Oh, you're welcome. I know that this is a super busy time for candidates, so they have you know tons to do. So the ones the, if people show up, it's absolutely wonderful, and we're going to support all the Democrats even even when they can't come to meetings because they're too busy working. So thank you all for all that you do. Um, a little of the technical stuff, I'd like to, um, our Zoom host is Brad Kluwer, who is the Skagit Democrats uh, Zoom on this Zoom support team. He'll handle the muting and unmuting and any technical issues. If, you're, um, if you have any problem with anything, um, he can help you and he can help you off screen. Uh, a little later, if we need people need explanations, I'll talk about um, muting and unmuting. And Valid is our co-host. And just for you to you know, let you remind you that the meeting is being recorded and the videographer is Rita Sullivan. And uh, Brad and helps her and sends her the information and she makes a YouTube for us so that if there are people that want to couldn't make it to the meeting, um, who are interested, they also get a notification about YouTube. So that's really helpful. Um, I think we're ready to go unless there's some other comment. I wanted to read, I have, uh, I think we all know Deborah uh, uh, Lakanoff, but I'm gonna just read a little about her, uh, what she does. I mean, I could spend the whole meeting reading about what she does, but I think I'll let her talk and tell us because it's uh, absolutely astounding. Um, 
She represents the 40th, which includes parts of Whatcom Skagit in San Juan. She's a proud mom who fights every day to ensure younger generations, including her daughter, Emma, can continue to flourish. She is inclusive in her decision-making process by listening to stakeholders, citizens, and governmental bodies. She's known for her experience and capacity to work with vast parties on vast issues and get the job done. Sworn into the Washington State House of, Legis of Representatives, sorry, in January 2019, um, she's the only Native American woman to currently serve in the legislature. Um, she's also um, on multiple committees, government affairs director for the Swinomish tribe, but also uh, some of the committees um, are, but not limited to. So environmental, natural resources, climate change, education, housing, agriculture. Um, these are the committee, that's the issues that she's involved with. And she's vice chair of the House State Governmental and Tribal Relations Committee. She sits on the Appropriations Committee, the Rural Development, Agriculture, and Natural Resources Committee. Um, she's sponsored quite a few bills. If you get, uh, are on her mailing list, it's phenomenal. Every week you get an update on what's going on. So it's thank you, Deborah, for keeping us all informed about what's going on because it's easy to uh, get lost. And so um, your, you know, your interests are so wide and so expansive in this. Um, again, public safety, women's rights, labor rights, workforce development, sustainable infrastructure, environmental, <laughs> salmon stock recovery, abundant water. So um, thank you. That's all I can say for all you're doing. It's really amazing. So I'm gonna turn the meeting over to Deborah and let her tell us what's going on and what she'd like to share with us. So thank you. Thank you guys. It's really good to be here. Um, Barbara, let me know whether or not the um, fan behind me is too loud. Just thumbs up or thumbs down. Okay. Well, let me, let me move my view because my view shows just me. Um, and I'd rather be able to see all of you. Uh, first of all, um, to Jackie's husband, and I think he may have, David may have bumped off. I loved his title, Jackie's husband. Right. <laughs> I, I just, you know. With all I, due respect, that, that was me, Deborah. <laughs> I, I, <laughs> I, I, yeah, I, this is Brad. I, I did that as host. I, I, I tagged him with Jackie's husband. It's I, among I, friends here. I, I think it shows the values in our community, right? We're still a real community, no matter how much King County and the state legislature seems to think that we're uh, growing into an urban area. Skagit in the 40th is still very much a rural community. Anacortes closes down on Sunday. And I was sitting with a group of folks, Barbara and Bob, and they were like, we're all moving here. Like, why do you guys close down on Sunday? Like, that just doesn't make sense. I go, because there's still a family community oriented place to call home. On Sundays, it's a time of family. It's a time of rest. It's a time to gather yourself for the week. Until Anacortes builds its momentum up in their chamber of commerce and their families who've been here five, six, seven generations, and uh, Chairman Wooten decides that Sunday's a day for rapid uh, business, we take care of ourselves in Anacortes and get ready with families, grocery shopping, getting our meals prepped, getting our kids ready, and getting ready for the week. And that's what I love so much. A um, few names I haven't seen for a while. Jeff Mount, I have not seen you in a really long time. And if you can pop your camera on, I'd love to see your smile. Uh, Jeff gave me a lot of good advice and guidance in 2018 when I was running. And I really appreciated uh, the work, his honesty and his integrity that he shared. Uh, I have to tell you, one of the questions someone asked me uh, when I was uh, in my 2000, in my second term, I ran my second term unopposed also. And Andrea says, Deborah, how do you manage so many vast issues? And you have to remember, Andrea Dole and I both come from the politics of Alaska, where there's a minimal amount of people and a vast wide wingspan that you must prepare yourself to address. Um, and she helped guide me when I was running and, and serving in my first and second term, taking the 20 years of serving 
Indian tribes in the United States, Indian tribes in the region, in the state, and within uh, the Puget Sound, and within Swinomish, that you have to have a diverse experience, a diverse voice. You must surround yourself by good people, by people who will contribute to the values and the decisions that are made and need to be made in the places we all call home. So when Angie and I were talking, I said, your wingspan has to be this big. I have to know healthcare, I have to know natural resource, environment, economic development, workforce. I have to understand childcare. I have to understand the chamber of commerces and their responsibilities to their community. I have to understand agriculture and our farm workers in the 40th and 42nd in the 10th. And I need to understand public safety and the list goes on. And you have to be able to know that you aren't the only person as an elected official who carries all the answers because the answers are within your community. And that's why I can carry such a good wingspan. My Rolodex and you guys, I'm old enough and not to share my age, but my old enough is still quick where I can still remember. And my city clerk, Melissa, I was the intern as the city clerk to my city of Yakutat whose borough is one of the largest in the United States at the age of 14. And then at the age of 15, I interned for my, in summertime work, you know, when young people go to work back in the day to do internships in high school, I worked for the planner. So you can imagine, and back in the day in rural Alaska, we were still smoking cigarettes in those small, tiny buildings. So here's this 14 and 15 year old surrounded by cigarette smoke, Folgers coffee and styrofoam cups learning how to be a how to be a, a clerk for a city uh, borough and how to be a planner. So I knew planning at the age of 15. So I, I share this with you guys, just so you know a little bit about me, uh, just so you know how much appreciative I am of the 40th, how appreciative I am of the 42nd, the 39th and the 10th, and how much I love my job. I've had opportunities uh, when President Biden reaches down and says, Deborah, we'd like to appoint you as the new EPA administrator for Region 10. And it's like, it's like when home calls you home and says, we need you and we need your values. And unfortunately, you know, I would love to have given my time to President Biden and the administration in looking over and making decisions on behalf of the administration for Alaska, Washington, Idaho, and Oregon. The health of my family came first and my responsibility, my responsibility back to my community. You all elected me here as a reason and I need to fulfill what I committed to. And there'll be other times, right? There'll be other democratic, amazing presidents who I can give my time to down the road. So know that I'm not going anywhere. I'm happy where I'm at and I deeply appreciate the community I'm in. In fact, I have to tell you, Andrea and Bob are just like one block down. So I know if I ever need anything, I can run down or Andrea will stop by and make sure I'm doing okay. Um, this is a community that I live in. And I, I'm hoping, Barbara, that we can keep this as a conversation because you all don't want to listen to me talk for a half hour. Uh, feel <laughs> free to pipe in with a question. Um, I go back to uh, Andrew. Uh, thank you for the work that you're doing for Clyde. Clyde is an incredible young man who's running for office, and we have an, a, a great chance to really hold on to the House Democrats managing, handling, holding that gavel when we elect Clyde. He's a young man. He has a long history in politics that we need to be able to carry through. When we hear the Republicans say, Roe versus Wade is already taken care of in Washington, y'all don't have to take care of that. Andrew's right. We do have to be very careful because the Washington Republican Party is looking very carefully at how the national strategy is being implemented and bringing it back home. So we need to continue to voice that it is our body, that it's our decision, and it is a place that we need to protect is our rights that were withheld in Roe versus Wade. My daughter's 18 years old. To have her look at me and say, my goodness, we're still talking about this today. And then look back to the women who have led leadership positions like Andrea and say, yes, I can't believe we're still talking about this today. Or Rita, 
we're still talking about this today. Or Barbara, we're still right. talking about this today. So we, we will continue to advocate. And I know the governor is gonna to continue to advocate along with the attorney general and with our, uh, our speaker Jenkins and with our Senate majority leader, uh, Andy Billig, that they will continue to support the work that we do in Washington state for Roe versus Wade. Um, you're absolutely right, Andrew. Public safety is one of the leading issues in our swing districts that are still being raised, not in a negative way, right, Andrew? It's in a way that says, how do we build the public safety community of tomorrow? How do we build the public safety who recognize diversity, who recognize culture, who recognize the role of who we can be as public safety officer, officers within, within our places that we call home. You know, I partnered with Representative Theringer on public safety, thinking, you know, we have an incredible, um, incredible work being done in Mount Vernon by our police off, by our police chief, and working with Joe Bordeaux and understanding how they intersect within our Latino Hispanic community was really important to know that they're within the schools, speaking to the kids, speaking to the community, engaging and saying, we aren't people to be afraid of, we're people who wanna keep you safe. Um, talking to the Swinomish tribe, listening to their chief of police there, engaging on how they wanna build the police officers tomorrow. Swinomish tribe has actually done an incredible job of public safety, bringing the young kids in to learn who these police officers are. How do they keep them safe? How do we want to be able to incorporate safety for all of the people, all of the children for long-term comes? So Andrew, thank you. Your words are really spot on today. Um, I wanted to talk a little bit about, and I'm going to pull up my, my notes here because believe it or not, I have uh, those of you who have, and, and I'll say Brad, who've known me uh, almost 15 years, know I can speak very fast. And I wanted to slow down a little bit and just share with you guys some of the bills that we've worked on in climate change and natural resources, uh, public safety and homelessness and housing. Because correct me if I'm wrong, if there's any other areas, I can take a look at that too. But I wanted to be able to touch base and say, what did we do in 2022? And what are we looking at in 2023? And then um, Caitlin, I know you're taking notes tonight. Let's make sure we talk about the importance and values of get out the vote for our amazing candidates who are part of my team. And that's Alex, uh, that's David, uh, that's my new friend Clyde who's coming up. And that's also reaching up to the 42nd and making sure Alicia gets elected, Joe Timmons gets elected in the 42nd and also um, our amazing Sharon Shoemake who, uh, I couldn't do a lot of the work I do without her. So, Caitlin, let's just make sure we follow through and talk about the events that we'll be hosting with them and how important Get Out the Vote is. Let me see. Barbara, does that sound like a good framework yeah. for tonight's visit? I think so. And I think we'll have time for questions if people have questions or. And, and pipe in a pause, like pause with me. Like, yeah, Barbara, like just raise your hand, pop in. I'm, I would love to be able to pretend like we we're sitting outside in my backyard, Bob and Andrea, uh, sitting outside my backyard um, in this beautiful sunshine, uh, having a visit instead of on Zoom, but we'll do that someday soon. Okay, if anyone has any, oh, excuse me. I was just gonna say, if somebody has questions, um, just go into the reactions part of your screen down below and press the little, yellow button that has a little hand and then um, we can see that you have a question um, and Deborah can answer that you know after she's done with a little bit of the talk that she's done doing okay so that's for people to be able to raise their hands without interrupting you so you can keep your train of thought here great okay I'm, and I'm excited I, and Brad if you see a hand raised and I don't see it just pause me right um, sure, certainly Okay, so I'm going to go into a couple bills. Let's talk about the 2022 legislative success and priorities. Uh, first, I want to be able to thank uh, Chair Fitzgibbon. Uh, Chair Fitzgibbon has done an extraordinary job. He is a young man who started out as an LA 
He has lived his whole life in the state legislature, and he is a young man in his 30s. He is a young man with an old soul. I often think that uh, uh, Chair Fitzgibbon, um, with his old soul, makes decisions in that time frame like I do, seven generations. But he's also a very patient man who understands the state legislature moves slow, they move very carefully, and they move in bienniums by budget. So let's talk about climate change. House Bill 1619, appliance efficiency standards. I have to tell you the work of the appliance efficiency actually came from Representative Jeff Morris. Jeff really worked hard on the appliances from his point of view. His legendary work of serving, correct me if I'm wrong, Rita, over almost 20 years. And he also ran unopposed many times. His work still carries on today in the legislature. So thank you to the 40th for their leadership. House Bill 1619, it takes great strides towards a greener, cleaner, more sustainable energy grid in the recent years, but we can do more. 1619 expands energy efficiency standards to a greater range of household appliances to reduce green gas pollution, water use, and costs for Washington families. Now remember, I believe we've got till 2045 to reduce our, our green gas emissions and turn our electricity into green, uh, using green energy. And this is the goal of Washington state. Now, we don't produce the largest amount of carbon emissions in the Northwest, right? Washington is very green. We've always been that efficient. We have the most forest, most trees. We run on hydro. We're not saying Washington state needs to go green and reduce carbon emissions because we're doing horrible bad things with our energy. It's because we are leading example across this nation on climate change and because we are already, before it was a law, requiring our lifestyles based on our values to live a cleaner, greener life. The laws we're putting in place, is just a reflection of what we're already doing. And this is what I appreciate of the governor, Governor Inslee, but also previous governors in the past who made sure when you build Washington, Let's build it right. Let's build it as green as we can. Let's build it with economic integrity, workforce transition, and economic prosperity for the future. So think of appliances. And I have to tell you, not everybody can afford green appliances, right? I mean, raise your hand. It's all of us know it's harder and more expensive to go green than it is to go the cheaper version, which impacts our our pockets more so down the road and we're just borrowing from our children's future when we continue to use all green energy which i don't know if all of you are interested but i do not want my granddaughter paying for the mistakes that we have today corinne it's nice to see you it was nice to see you in the parade i just saw that your name popped up on the board um i also want to appreciate uh another great young leader coming in she is representative Dewar. Uh, down down in the Snohomish area. She comes from a city council background. She's worked on reducing methane emissions by landfills. Okay, I come from a small community in Southeast Alaska. We still have landfills. We still burn our garbage in our small town of 500. We are changing that. In the past five years through EPA's um, programs, smaller communities in Alaska are looking to reduce their landfills and make them more greener and recyclable. They are where we were 20 years ago. So I go back to the good work of Representative Dewar. And these are bills that I've signed on to, bills I've had opportunity to engage in. Representative Dewar's bill is 1663. Methane is a hundred times worse than carbon dioxide when it comes to trapping heat mm. and changing our environment. And much of it comes from our state's landfills. House Bill 1663 requires large municipal landfills to install and operate gas collection and control systems to capture methane and prevent it from getting into the atmosphere. We deserve to do this. Now, although we are doing this in large municipalities, we have local control. There are grants, there are opportunities through Department of Commerce, where if we have landfills in our rural communities, again, we live in rural communities, we can also retain any assistance, any funding, and any guidance. 
and believe me, I don't mind amending this in the next biennium and saying not just um, large municipal, but also having rural communities contribute and regaining funding and building their capacity to do it. So there's an amendment to House Bill 1663 that can come out of the 40th. But we had to make a start and Representative Dewar did a great job there. Um, one thing that I, I was really uh, excited about when we worked on the Climate Commitment Act and the Washington Strong Act, the governor and I, we were running side by side, two bills that would reduce carbon emissions. Um, I'd like to say I ran side by side with the governor, but I have to tell you, the governor's got a little bit more clout uh, than Representative Lacanel. And, and, I, and I say that because I've known Jay for 20 years, going back to when he was a congressman. Um, so I deeply respect the work he did. But Senator Lovelet, Representative Shoemaker and I thought there was an alternative way through Washington Strong to be able to look at how we are going to invest in reducing carbon emissions through carbon climate change bonding, where all the funding would be set up to go back into the communities and go back into industry and to go back into natural resources and habitat. And those projects and programs that would reduce carbon emissions, but also um, through habitat recovery, suck in the carbon emissions. You got to have both. Um, I support the Climate Commitment Act 100%. I was thankful when the governor brought me in and said, Deborah, you and your amazing team of Senator Lovelet and Shoemake and your stakeholders created a spending plan that we would like to take and incorporate into the Climate Commitment Act. Uh, one section that we wanted to add to that, and this was in House Bill 1753, that was the consultation with our tribes. If we're going to incorporate, we need to, in carbon emissions, we need to have a partner to fight climate change, right? The state can't fight climate change alone. Our local counties and cities can't do it alone. Our citizens can't do it alone. And our tribes can't do it alone. We need to build that framework together. And you have to remember, and this is what I carry in my teachings of 20 years of working with Washington tribes, they are sovereign nations, so we must consult with them. Uh, House Bill 1753 sets in place a procedure for tribal consultation for the Climate Commitment Act funded projects. Um, we will work in meaningful consultation with the tribes on the projects, on evaluating the projects, and then investing in not only their communities, but how do they partner at the local level? Imagine Anacortes partnering with Swinomish, partnering with Samish, and finding good climate change projects that we can invest in. We've already got one of the best wastewater treatment plants in the nation with broadband running through our community, public broadband, which is phenomenal. No one else was doing this in the state. Anacortes, again, <laughs> rises up. Mm. And this, this is, these are my constituents who teach me. Um, Another uh, house bill that I'm going to look at is strengthening our energy codes. Washington's building sector is the fastest growing source of green gas pollution and current accounts for a quarter of our state's emissions, a quarter. And this is our building sector. Because buildings can last anywhere from 50 to 100 years, the decision we made during construction can have long-term impacts on the future. I love this bill. I had the opportunity to sit down with University of Washington's Climate Energy Group, or I'm sorry, Climate Action Group, and they've been there, gosh, when did we create this? We created the Swinomish Climate Change Infrastructure Plan almost, I would say, 18 years ago. We were the first tribe at Swinomish to build that plan. We looked at what building emissions and what the impact was to our communities. House Bill 1770 catches us up to where Swinomish was and the University of Washington's climate commitment uh, or climate, um, climate action plan is. It updates the state energy code to save power and money while moving away from green gases with an 80% reduction in emissions by 2035. It is requiring new buildings, new buildings to be net zero already. We can ensure we're building sustainable for the first time. So I'll, I'll pause there 
and just let you guys imagine. Could you imagine if we were able to take the 40th and we were to be able to make sure that our state buildings were all green? So any new buildings would be built green. And I see an amendment to 1770, and, and you guys are working with me here. I'm thinking out loud. Uh, making an amendment that says any repairs and upgrades to any new fed, uh, state buildings must also be green. But imagine if we provided a grant in funding to our cities and counties that were able to do the same. The Mount Vernon uh, Public Library and Community Center is green. We were able to put 75 electrical plugins into that building to, and it is, let's see, Mount Vernon's public library, 75 plugins. I believe it is the only facilities that has the largest amount of electrical plugins north of Seattle. And that's the 40. Again, leading by example. So I'll pause there and see if anyone has any, any questions. Other than that, I can move into just a couple more uh, clean energy bills. Yeah, I have a question about the natural gas issue in the building, in the new green buildings. Um, that seems to have been an issue that came up with one of the campaigns um, with Alex and Trevor. I, I wondered if you could clarify that a little bit. Let me look. Um, I believe, let me look at Alex's bills. We have some work to do in 2023. So one of the bills that my friend um, Alex is looking at and it's House Bill 1767. And it says authority of publicly owned electric utilities to engage in targeted electrification. Burning natural gas in our homes and buildings now accounts for a quarter of Washington's green gas pollution. Not only does this release methane into the atmosphere, so again, we in the 40th are trying to take responsibility to reducing carbon emissions, which is our goal mandated by the Climate Commitment Act, accelerating our, wors our worsening climate crisis. Uh, it also poses a significant threat to the health and well being of families who are forced to breathe it in. Now, I, I wanna pause there and, and think about this for just a moment. Lummi Nation recently received uh, in the last year a report back from the Clean Air, a Clean Air report. And they're, they are being deeply impacted by the, the uh, industry surrounding them based on the poor air quality that's coming from uh, the industries that are surrounding them, and it's deeply impacting the health of their community. So put that in check when we talk about um, well-being of families who are forced to breathe it in. Uh, House Bill 1767 would have allowed local public utilities to offer consumers incentives to tr transit to clean, safe, reliable electric appliances from their home, by allowing local utilities and consumers to pursue these opportunities voluntarily. Um, I think what we're seeing is something of a interesting situation. If I understand correctly, the Biden administration is looking and does, is saying that does not have natural gas categorized, categorized as harm. It is harm to the environment, but it is not categorized in that carbon emissions. Now I'm not the University of Washington's climate change group. So please work with me here a little bit. Um, the concept of natural gas and the concept of going green and working with our communities on making sure that we have an offer there, I think is something that we should steeply consider. I don't wanna get in between the argument and I don't want to say the argument, the policy platforms between the two candidates, who, the two Democrat candidates who are running. But I will say the Washington Democrats have a platform on natural gas and they are looking to reduce it. And, and yep. that comes out of, out of what we're looking to do at a statewide level. And if the Washington Democrats are looking to reduce natural gas, then that seems to me that our family here with us tonight 
are just valuing what the Washington State Democrats are looking at. So I don't know if I'm confusing you, Barbara. Uh, I just want to make sure that we, we respect both of those Democratic races. Um, Alex has been in this world a very long time of working with natural gas politically uh, in his uh, work world. So I understand and respect when he brings and sits down with an idea and concept for a bill. Um, he's coming with years of experience behind it, not only from the 40th perspective, but the 42nd perspective, but also working on a transboundary basis on the Kinder Morgan pipeline. So there's a lot of experience that comes from when Alex is developing bills that is trying to represent the platform of the Washington State Democrats and the governor's office. Okay, thank you. Hey, yeah. Deb, we have a couple of hands up. Um, Valit has his hand up, and then I have um, a comment too after Valit. Uh, uh, thank you, Marwan. Uh, uh, thank you, Congressman Lakov. I appreciate uh, you being here. Um, if I may, I support everything you said about green energy, switching to uh, electrical power, if you will. Uh, but my my concern is when you look at the the energy or the the, the, the uh, bill that the consumers have to pay. When you switch from natural gas to electric, especially in heating, it really, as a minimum, it doubles the, uh, the amount of money you have to pay on a monthly basis. Will that be possible in the future to assist uh, some you know, lower income folks with their bills, uh, at least for you know, a certain period of time? Uh, I, I mean, I don't know if there has been any consideration of that. Thank you. There, there was some work done in the state legislature, and it came out of the COVID impact. Um, COVID had so many reliefs for our communities, and you don't have to be low income to get that relief. Uh, it's middle class, it's elders, it's retirees, right? This is the demographics of my 40th community. Um, there's opportunities through Department of Commerce that would help relieve your energy bills, but also provide incentives if you wanted to go and get into um, getting new windows. Right now, there's a huge incentive out there right now to get windows for your homes that would help reduce energy. Uh, there's opportunities to get appliances. There's opportunities through utilities uh, to help you transition into uh, green electricity. Um, there's not only that opportunity and through the weatherization program of commerce, but Philippe also um, utilities are is providing twice as much money for the incentives to be able to do that, to be able to transition to appliances, to be able to, to get your house ready for a green plug-in. Um, right now, the governor is exploring opportunities to bring in more electric vehicles. Uh, we only have a few electric vehicle um, companies within Washington state. Uh, Chairman Fitzgibbon is looking to expand that with Senator Carlisle. Um, uh, I think one thing that's really unique too is we as local government could be looking at how do we incentivize our community? And that might be, you know, Representative Lakanoff, Senator Lovelet uh, are sitting down and bringing in renewable energy um, funding opportunities and doing, you know how you have a job fair? Uh, wouldn't it be fun if the Fidalgo Dems did a green energy fair <laughs> and we went down to the waterfront and we said, you wanna green your houses? You want to use less water in your lawns and learn how to use more natural plants. You want to use less pesticides. You want to green out of cordis. Um, and I love Liz. How fun it would be to partner with the Fidalgo Dems to host something like that down in the waterfront at the Anacortes market. Because sometimes it's not just depending on the federal and state government. It's depending on local government and then your own citizen groups such as this who carry so many voices. Uh, speaking of which, I need a little bit of native plants in my own yard just down the street, Andrea. So I think I might have to go home and get some strawberry plants and some salmon berry plants from Yakutat and plant them. I'll make sure I bring some down to your house. <laughs> but, but, I, but I like your idea, Valid. It's remembering that it takes all governing bodies to be able to work towards collaboration and building those incentives and building funding opportunities at the end of the day. Thank you. Uh, thank you. I'm, I'm moving this way because the beautiful sunshine just keeps coming in. 
So you get to see the rest of my dirty house, my, my yoga mat, my cedar, uh, my treadmill against the wall, my cedar hat, my record player. Welcome to my mess, family. Uh, Brad, did you had your hand raised? I don't know. I think, yeah. Andrew, I think Andrew has a hand raised too, Brad, when you get done. Oh, let me ask her to unmute. Andrea, I think oh, you're unmuted. Okay. All right, yeah. Uh, Deborah, can you talk a little bit more about the dams right now? They're making headlines. Could you say a little bit about where, where you're standing on that and what the what it looks like? Oh, thank you for asking that question. While we're in the environmental world, I will address the Snake River dams. Um, mm -hmm. This week, I was invited back to meet with legislators, um, and I'm sorry, legislators, congressional folks and agencies on the Snake River dams and breaching the dams and what those next steps have been. I've had the incredible opportunity to have past chairman, now vice chairman, uh, Shannon, um, reach out to me and say, Deborah, can you join us? Uh, right now, I'm the only legislator who's really come out and signed on to the petitions to breach the Snake River Dam, to look at building the new economies of what that area would look like, of building infrastructure for the granary industry on how they're going to transport uh, the grains from that area. But one of the most exciting conversations we're having, and it came from actually going and touring the Snake River Dams in 2020, was sitting down with Senator Hasegawa. And this is what happens with years of experience of sitting down with someone like Senator Hasegawa. We could actually, the state has an opportunity and we could build, and I don't know if the right terminology is Andrea, but what, where the trains go by, I could actually build a leg off of that that goes into that community and we could put their grain on the trains, but the state would need to invest in it. But, but that's what we do as state, right? We take care of our natural resources. It's our fiduciary responsibility. We can partner on a, on a trans-state basis, but we could, the, the granary transportation, rather than putting it on the trucks, where we're hearing the opposition say it's gonna increase carbon emissions, you're, you're gonna use more gas, et cetera, et cetera. Senator Hasegawa had a great idea in his concept of infrastructure to build a, a leg off of the existing train that would come into that area and transport the grain. So unfortunately, I wasn't able to attend this week. Um, I'm here with all of you, uh, but I did and continue to advocate and be part of the ongoing uh, presentations and discussions on the Snake River Dam. So so thank you for, for bringing me into that and asking that question. I think I see Dawn and Marie are raising their hand too. Yeah, Deborah. Can you hear me okay? Yes, sir. Uh, I was going to ask, before the other person, I was going to ask you about the uh, lower Snake River dams. I think there's four of them on the snake. Is that right? Four, yeah. Uh, do those, each of those dams have fish ladders? You know, I'm sorry, I couldn't tell you the exact infrastructure conversation on that, but Caitlin, if you can Google that and take a look at it, she can put that answer in the chat, Dan. Uh, Don, I'm sorry, because that's that's a good question to be asked. And I unfortunately don't have, this is why I surround myself with good people. I don't have the, the technical expertise in that and to answer that. The, the, part of my question is, you know, we could have the, the dam stay there and the fish going up fish ladders. Now, if they have fish ladders and for some reason or other, the fish aren't using the fish ladders, that's a biological and a scientific question problem that they're going to have to resolve. But first of all, I'd have to know if there are fish ladders or not. And I see that for building for Amazon. she's put a little bit of information on the side, Don. And even though we have fish ladders, whether or not the fish ladders are working, then we can go into more discussions on whether or not that works. Yeah. So, so I agree with you. And um, also, just to let you guys know, the more proactive work I've done with the dams, um, I've asked Department of Ecology to take a look at the dams in Washington state and what's really working and what's not working. Do we need these dams? Are these dams not like, are they, are they just taking taxpayers money? Uh, what's the capacity of the facilities? Are they up to par? 
do they have fish ladders? Uh, I go back to the incident that happened in Piala yeah. where um, they were repairing and working on dams down at the Piala River. And underneath the radar, they planted um, old broken down bits of tires along the side of the river, thinking that it was gonna help with the dam and the dam work down there, only to find out when it flooded, all that polluted tire pieces went into the Piala River. But yet that dam that they're working on really did produce a sufficient amount of energy to really make a difference. And it didn't also have today's technology. Uh, I went further into Department of Ecology to understand whether or not these dams are built to address the changing of environmental impacts and whether or not they've incorporated climate change into the restoration of the dams. So, and also, I mean, I'm looking right here on the Skagit and the work that Upper Skagit has been working on, Upper Skagit Tribe, on the dams on the Skagit. Um, we're the only river in the lower 48 that's producing all five species of wild salmon. You know, we, we have a national responsibility uh, to protect that. Um, these are questions that I'm bold enough to ask, Don, but I'm also, I'm also patient enough to know, give me the science behind it to prove that sometimes common sense, practical legislative decisions need to be made. And it's needed to be made not only based on the science, but it's based on making sure that our taxpayers' money is being spent in the right way and spent in a way that's not wasteful. Sorry, that was like, kick me off my soapbox, Don. I did, I did mean to jump on that so much. You asked a very simple question and I went a little too deep, but hopefully that was helpful. Brad, you have, looks like you have your hand up as well. Um, my bandwidth is having a little trouble here. Am I being heard okay? Yeah. yeah. Um, Deb, do you find um, that the numbers on efficiencies I, I, I'm on the Environment and Climate Change Committee with the party, and we wrestle with a lot of the detail on these things. And I'm the you know the numbers in terms of efficiencies of heat pumps versus um, natural gas heating are the are those you know heat pumps are just just many fold times more efficient at heating homes and water and, and air spaces, you know, businesses than natural gas, just heating air. Um, does, does that play in an, under, an understanding of why we're changing the laws to do that, where you actually are able to cite the numbers or, because I, I haven't heard the numbers cited at the public level. We, we grapple that with them in terms of the um, creating um, the platform for the party and then um, argue about them among ourselves and, and the technologies and things, and then put forward something, but we don't ever say, and it, 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 that, you know, heating a home with a heat pump is going to save you, you know, 75% of, off your, off your gas bill, uh, or off your utility bills. Um, and I've noticing that I, I'm not really hearing that from anybody when it when it's so profoundly um, impactful for finances. Like Valit just said that it it's expensive. Well, the the stuff pays for itself. Um, and and I, I'm not I'm not hearing that in the public discourse. And I'm wondering if you are or and it, and if you're not hearing it. Um, is there kind of a reason why? Do, do people not hear the numbers? I don't think we're, um, I'll, I'll be, let me be honest. I don't think we're educating our community well enough for them to understand. I, I think that's a big area that we could be promoting at local government level and at the state legislature level. I don't understand as a common homeowner how the heat pumps are going to reduce it. I also don't understand as a homeowner why I, and I'm not a homeowner, I'm, I'm a renter, but I'm just putting myself in that perspective. Imagine a young 35 year old couple who's buying a house right now, who's trying to understand, like if I want to make sure I buy a house that's green and ready, and if I'm not going down the right pathway, Brad, pull me back. But we're not educating homeowners today, homeowners, 
that are going to be future homeowners, how that we need to invest into our places we call home with green energy, but we're also not providing perhaps enough incentives to get um, the right tools in our homes so we can reduce the cost of our bills because we have to pay so much up front in order not only to pay less in the future, but our responsibility to climate change and to the environment and natural resources. There aren't very many people um, who understand that concept. I think we as a state can do better with our incentives and programs to help not just low income people, but middle-class people, people who are, who are just, because our, our middle class, I hate to jump all over the place, Brad, but our middle class are the next victims of homelessness. So like they're struggling just to make a mortgage payment. Now you want me to pay, I'm throwing a number out there, $10,000 to upgrade the heating system in my house when I can barely pay my mortgage rent just to be right. able to reach the carbon change emissions. So I think right. we, the state legislature, could do better by providing incentives, we could do better by providing programs, we could do better by educating. And, and right. I can go back to, um, I, I just bought like, I just have a lot of, uh, um, uh, what do you call it, uh, lawn furniture put into my backyard because I want to do coffee table round tables, Brad, at my house and invite uh -huh. Brad over to talk to us about, you know, what is it we could be doing as a state legislator, state legislators to provide incentives, funding, and programs through the Department of Commerce in the housing program to not just get low-income people, but new homeowners, to any class of of income to green their houses. And I right. think it's a lack of education, lack of money, a lack of investment by the state. But the Climate Commitment Act was put in place to take the revenue that was coming from there to do exactly what you and I are talking about here, to bring right. people. I sit on a... Um, and if I answered your question, or I'm hey, going boss. on the right pathway, I, I hope that's okay. Yeah, yeah you're right on. I'm uh, I'm understanding. Just on the Zoom, but I'm let let me off. mute Andrea here. Um, uh, another thing that I wanted to share, Brad, because you're leading me to another good conversation when we talk about utilities and clean energy. Um, I sit on a, I'm the only legislator to sit on a utilities think tank led by Governor Gregoire. And I have the mayor of uh, Bellingham, uh, Seth Fleetwood, sitting with me. Um, we're learning from this incredibly smart utility, renewable energy, energy, housing, GMA, folks who are working on how do we address shifting our utilities into being um, green, focused on green energy and reaching the Climate Commitment Act goal. And within that conversation, we're hearing that we're going to have 20 to 30 days potentially of the energy grid being overburdened by the energy impacts of our communities. This means more air conditioning or this means more heat. This means that our buildings aren't green. The story I'd like to share with you is my first meeting I attended was in Bellingham, or I'm sorry, was in Bellevue, right, Brad? I'm sitting in Bellevue surrounded by all of these large scale office buildings, 30 stories high, high tech, et cetera. And for the last two years during COVID, maybe 30% of them were filled, but yet we were still running high energy through those buildings because our buildings weren't green. They weren't built green. They didn't have solar panels on them. They weren't being having the energy reduction of climate change and heat being managed in an effective way to reduce energy. Our own buildings could be reducing the impact to the power grid if we as the state legislature would incorporate policies and laws, programs, incentives, monitoring and follow through to make sure that these buildings in Seattle and Bellingham and Spokane around the state are built to reduce the energy. That's not the answer to everything, right? It's just a little piece of the puzzle uh, that I raised. There's also the fact that we're going to have to start reducing uh, the use of um, the increase of heat. What was it? 94 degrees in Seattle. Um, in eastern Washington, they already have a man uh, mandate where the utility company will come in and turn your air conditioning 
down to save energy. You'll get $75 or $60 as an incentive from a utility company, but it's reducing the use of the energy grid. So I shifted that panel with Governor Gregoire and all those brilliant think tankers and to say, we don't need to create more energy as the sole answer. We also need to reduce the use of energy on the power grid. And this comes into the use of water. In Eastern Washington, they're already reducing and mandating how much water you can use in Eastern Washington. It gets turned off for your lawn. Your lawn, or you, you as a homeowner only get so much water for your lawn. That's coming down the pipe for Western Washington as we face increased heat, increased needs of water for in-stream flow and for salmon and for agriculture and for growth and for groundwater for those homes that are fitting on it. So, sorry, Brad, you, I, I went into a whole big area that we probably weren't prepared for, but it's where my world is spinning right now. Is, no apology is, necessary. That's really interesting. Yeah, yeah as your legislator, those are my conversations I'm wrapped into. By the way, I pushed a URL that we use quite a bit in the Environment and Climate Change Caucus um, uh, group called damnsense.org, which um, does a really great uh, job of kind of summing up the argument for removing those dams. Um, and to uh, speak to Don's question a little bit, we um, really dug into this on that committee and um, there's been is more money spent on trying to make those dams work for fish than I think it's the the value of the electricity of the dams. It's just really been crazy how, um, and, and, and in spite of all of that, the, the fish ladders don't work effectively um, enough to allow the fish to survive. But that URL is a really good source for um, a bunch of that detail. Sometimes we need some damn sense. That's right. <laughs> I'm, looking at, uh, I'm looking at your time. And I know we focused a lot on the environment today. And I did probably get to all the areas. And I'm happy to come back anytime and talk about um, affordable housing um, and talk about public safety. But I want to be respectful of, of our our community and our family here and see if there's any anything I may have missed on environment, natural resources, and clean energy that would have been helpful. I had a question about um, incentives for people. Are, is the state looking at, um, say, incentivizing people by giving um, rebates or things like that if people do put in, um, say, uh, heat pumps, which or uh, solar panels or any of that? Is there any kind of way to get money back to the homeowner to encourage that use so it's, it balances out what it would cost to do that um, and put in a regular furnace? Or, do you see what I'm saying? To help I do. I think we can go two ways. Um, my, dog, my dog's hungry and he's like, you got to feed me, mom. Uh -oh. So if you hear him, if you could see him, you guys, look, he's yes, begging. He's very cute. He's, he's, he's begging right now to, to, to feed him. So um, it comes in two folds right now. Uh, we have incentives that are coming through the Department of Commerce that provides capacity. But one thing I've always said is it doesn't just have to be low income. It has to be, we have to have enough funding for all levels. Um, and I also think that it's not only for the, for the homeowners, but it's also to build green. We have to take um, our builders association and make sure that they have the incentives and they have the support to, if you're gonna build a house, build it green. And, but we as constituents and we as people uh, who want to purchase these houses, we need to let the builders association know that. Right now, the building association is thinking, if you build green, it's gonna cost us way too much money. So we need to give them incentives, right? Um, if you build green, we don't have enough supplies and resources. So we as the state legislature need to make sure that we have the supplies to build green. Um, and then also, if we're looking to invest in 
the Growth Management Act here, and both all of you know the Growth Management Act is going to be revised in the next 10 years. This is your zoning, your comprehensive plans. Uh, this is how you're going to grow our communities. Um, imagine if the Growth Management Act said, if we're going to grow and if we're going to zone and if we're going to build our communities, let's include climate change, let's include agriculture, let's include nature positive, meaning good, clean, environmentally and natural resource sound decisions to be able to grow the areas that we live in. This means zone your areas, and this is incentives of how, how we get the incentives, Barbara. At the local level, your GMA takes a look at your comprehensive plans and says, we're gonna grow our infrastructure green, we're gonna build green, we're gonna zone areas green, and we as a state legislature have to respond to that GMA requirements by funding these programs. You build the law, local government's obligated. State government built the law, you should be able to help, help support financially, regulatory, monitoring, and follow-up wise to local government and to tribal government to make sure that we follow through with those, those laws that we put in place. One thing I'm not a fan of, don't build a state law and leave local <laughs> cedar and build local government and have local government left out without any process, any support, and any finances to be able to implement it because you're just causing chaos within your own communities. So long answer to your short question. No, it's a great, yeah, it's, uh, you know, you don't want to produce unfunded mandates, you know, because no. it doesn't do any good. I got food. <laughs> Starving dog. No, that's okay. He will, he will get very upset and you guys don't want to hear him whine, whine with me. <laughs> I have a dog. I totally understand. He thinks he's starving two minutes after he eats. Um, Dogs and kids. Does anyone else... Um, have any questions in this area for uh, Deborah? The environmental area, things that have come up in the papers and things. Um, I know the one thing that came up was the Swinomish participated in the uh, study on the death of all the, the different shellfish. That that was in the newspaper a while ago. On that, that there were uh, shellfish. I have the article. I forgot. They're doing a study. Was it the green crab? Yeah. Well, it was um, dead cock cockley, C O C K L E S. It's Cockles? A, yeah, it's a kind of shellfish yeah. that's dying. And uh, there was some interest in uh, that's another area that I think is kind of an interesting that uh, with environmental issues, that things actually don't survive well if uh, we don't take care of our environment. So not just housing and that, but also just the natural resources of it. So mm -hmm. I, I wanted to thank the Swinomish for participating in that and being so actively involved. That's really, really, really important. Well, Sarah, you've come, are you, um, do you have a question? I, yeah, I think I'm pretty interested in um, how to bridge the conflict between the uh, uh, some of the, the uh, agricultural interests and the interests of the salmon and the restoration of shoreside um, uh, restoration that was in the Lurie and Loomis Act. Um, when that first appeared in the news, there was just all of this big... Uh, negative press about it from the perspective of that um, agricultural folks and land loss. So I'd really like to hear your thoughts, Deborah, on how we negotiate um, that difference of opinion. How do we get the, I mean, there's so many ways in which the farmers and the fishers are all together on this as when we talk about things like the um, uh, fully contained communities. It's like everybody can be on the same page. But when it came to the shoreside rep uh, restoration to be able to shade the streams for the salmon, then there was a big hue and cry about losing agricultural land. Would you would you give us your insights about how we negotiate that difference? Off mute here. Um, thank you for bringing up that discussion that's been 
alive in the Skagit since um, the Skagit was turned from farmlands, uh, was turned from salmon restoration and deltas into, into agriculture today. Uh, we've got over 800 uh, fishermen, crabbers that reside upon a healthy ecosystem to sustain their treaty right, their cultural right, and their way of life. We've got 800, over 800 farmers of all different sizes within the Skagit that are fourth and fifth generation, some of them are fourth and fifth generations. Uh, we've got over 100 dikes within, those of you who don't know what dikes are, I think you know what they are, but there's over 100 of them that are built within the Skagit that need to be um, restructured so they're salmon friendly, but restructured so when we're flooding, uh, down in the Samish or down in the Skagit, that those homes are protected. So imagine my responsibility and my large wingspan in understanding the question that you brought forward. Um, I have to applaud uh, Senator Rofus, who partnered with myself and others, who took a look at the process in which we need to use the state legislature to stakeholder the tribal communities with their treaty rights and with their inherent rights, two different things. Mm -hmm. um, the agriculture community, cities and counties, and environmental communities, and, and all of you, my constituents. We need to stakeholder away within Washington state of how we incorporate uh, not only our treaty responsibility, remember Washington state's the other half of the bold decision, or the other half of the 50, 50 percent of the bold decision, we have a responsibility to um, 120,000 jobs and $6 billion coming into the state legislature based on commercial and recreational fishing. Uh, and then the treaty right. Uh, we have a responsibility to put food on the table. Uh, many of us eat our salmon with a potato. Uh, many of us love our raspberries and blueberries. Uh, this is part of the economies. Uh, Washington state was an apple state before it was a salmon state before it was an apple state. Uh, I need to balance this in, in the conversations we're having. So um, when the Lorraine Loomis bill came through, we understood and heard clearly from the tribes, from the governor's office, from the stakeholders, from cities and counties, and from agriculture, we need to have a stakeholding process to create pathways together. We may not always agree, but we have to come together and have those conversations to find out what is it that we did, uh, that we can improve legislatively using every tool possible, whether it's a law, whether it's investing in programs, whether it's uh, shared decision making, what can we be doing better? And that's what we propose this year is to, to breathe through all of the incredible work that was done in the Lorraine Loomis bill, work through all of the salmon recovery uh, work that needs to get done, because we have riparian buffers, one answer, right? We've got GMA. Can you imagine if salmon recovery incorporated, uh, if, if uh, nature positive was incorporated into salmon recovery? Um, could you imagine if we address the critical areas ordinances, the shoreline, uh, we were to address water, uh, water quality and water quantity. There's a whole bunch of conversations that go into uh, not just one bill, but numerous bills and making sure that if we invest in creating numerous bills through numerous legislative tools from here forward that bring our communities together, then we're able to find solutions every year. So Senator Rofus and I, a few other of my senators and legislators provided a proviso for the governor to hire a third party, pure third party, that would look at all of the different options of bringing and answering those questions that are needed to provide a healthy nature positive uh, place that we could all home that contributes to sound recovery, shellfish, dairy farmers, agriculture, growth, GMA, all of the areas and water, because it's not one answer. We're gonna need multiple answers and legislative tools. And it has to happen every year. Uh, just look at the way the governor ran his climate change bills, right, Sarah? The governor didn't run one bill, Right. He ran five to eight climate bills. He had over 35 senators and representatives running those bills for him. And he did them in increments and he did them in series and he had a plan. 
And that's what we hope this third party um, consultant is gonna be able to do for this governor's office and for the state is to create a plan. I don't know if many of you know, but right now you have eight Puget Sound salmon recovery plans. And every one of those eight salmon recovery plans based on the regions, every one of those regions have a watershed salmon recovery plan. Honest truth is we don't have a salmon recovery plan for Washington state period. And we don't have a common answer of what recovery looks like for the state of Washington. And this process will help us get there. And that is what I'm hoping we can do. It's almost like an ante, right, Angie? It's almost like an ante. You have the ante at the head of the table who has all of her vision that's been passed down for generations. And she's gonna bring everyone to the table and we're gonna to agree to disagree. And if you don't agree, stay at the table because we can work through your situation. So that's the long-term investment I have in Washington state is bringing everyone there, answering the question of how we're gonna sustain our life ways in the 40th, 42nd, 10th and 39th and in Washington state. And then do it together at all governing bodies, tribal, state, federal, and through all of our fiduciary responsibilities of judicial, executive and um, legislative. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Is, are there any other questions here? I'm not seeing any hands raised. Okay. Does anyone, anyone see something I missed? Please let me know. Anyway, um, I think that, you know, the environmental issues and uh, circumstances and things you're talking about are absolutely wonderful and interesting. And I'm really glad that you're looking at the big picture. I really appreciate the depth that you've gone into with the questions because it's so nice to have things in a little tiny box, but they're not in a tiny little box. So thank you for showing us the big picture of all these things because it's, it's very, it sounds very complicated. And you know, it's not like, oh, you just snap your fingers and have a solution. So thank you for all you're doing in that area and in all the other areas as well. So um, if people, I think that we're, you know, it's a little after eight, about 8.20. I don't know how people feel if we wanna go into other topics or we wanna have Deborah to come back sometime when you have some free time and kind of fill us in on other things that you're doing, which are pretty impressive as well. I'm happy to come back and do a series on public safety and the Blake decision. Uh, we've got a lot of work being done there. Um, Andrew, I'm happy to work offline with you on a couple of those topic areas too. Um, I'm a big fan of Clyde. I can't wait till we get to host uh, Clyde and Dave Paul's event in Lacana. Um, I'm happy to come back and talk about housing and homelessness and the work that we're getting there, kind of building you guys up to what the next session is going to look like. Um, we've got some work that we want to do in education. So um, I'm yours. Uh, if you guys want to get together on, on a, I don't even know, some evening on Zoom and just say, hey, Deb, we just want you to talk about public safety and the Blake decision, what the impact is going to be for us. Hey, Deb, we want to talk about um, education and how we're going to incorporate the new tools of education into our communities. Uh, Deb, we want to talk about how we're going to address migrant workers and the impact in protecting uh, the last labor law that was passed. Um, Barbara, you and Brad can just work with me and I'm happy to jump on for an hour in the evening and spend time with you. Okay, that's great. It's really good to know. Um, how's every, is everyone? Um, I'll, uh, I, I would have one question forward later. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, good. Not now, but later, De Deborah, I would like to have you talk more about the Growth Management Act. And uh, <laughs> just... It has such huge implications for a community. And, uh, and it's the usual question about state over local. And do you lose local control when you give in to the state? So uh, not tonight, you know, it's getting on, but I would love to hear you talk more about that. I'm really excited. My eight o'clock call this morning was with um, Senator Lovelett, uh, Senator Cooter, who is the chair of housing and local government, and uh, Senator Rofus of the Ways and Means on GMA bills that address um, uh, all different areas on the Growth Management Act, uh, housing, zoning, um, 
environmental protection, and then infrastructure. You know, we have 10 years worth of infrastructure coming down. Thank you, uh, Larson, Cantwell, and Murray for the work that they did. But if we don't build it green, right, we're gonna end up rebuilding it again. Or if we don't build it right with the right materials, we're gonna end up going backwards in our reduction of carbon emissions. So the four of us spent an hour and a half on the phone this morning, Andrea, on GMA. So you're you're uh, walking my path with me. That's That's good. All right, great. Good, thank you. Okay, I think we'll uh, kind of wrap up. I want to uh, thank Deborah. Thank you for all that you do in the legislature. Thank you for coming tonight and spending time with us and educating us, you know. And um, thank you, Brad, for being our host so we can figure out how to make sure these things happen. And um, what, you know, what I'm going to do is I'll end the meeting officially. We'll turn off the recording. But if people would like to stay and chat and talk, uh, I'll stick around and we can do that. So um, with that, I'm gonna ask uh, Brad to turn off the recording and we can, you know, people who 